So there's a couple of ideas that come out in Walter Brueggemann's work, um, and they definitely come out in this book, Out of Babylon, um, both of which can be a little tough for people to wrap their heads around. One is divine mutability. And of course, there's like an endless amount of theological ink spilled on whether God can be changeable at all, and if so, in what sense. It seems as though God would not be God if he could change somehow, and yet in the Old Testament, as well as the New, there are instances, in fact, instances abound, where God displays changes of mind, changes of mood, changes in direction, changes in judgment. And uh, so, you know, like, I don't want to try to solve this question, which I believe might be unsolvable, but I just want to say that where Brueggemann falls down on this, um, this debate is in favor, I think, of divine mutability. In other words, that he dwells upon the way in which God interacts with people in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, in a way of relationship that is actually very human in the sense that there are emotions displayed on both sides, that there are there is anger and there is repentance from anger. Um, and there is forgiveness and then anger again. Um, and so uh, thinking of God in this way is partly like a challenge to uh, our tendency to rationalize, right? And to try to square everything and to like read past those things that don't seem to make sense. But this is, this is kind of glaringly obvious from one perspective that God is depicted in the Old Testament as at least, maybe not, I'm not saying changing his like basic nature, but definitely changing mood and changing his mind on certain things over the course of time. So Brueggemann doesn't shy away from, from this depiction of God. In fact, um, he embraces it and uses it in the course of his arguments. So this is one thing that we just have to, I just bring up because it is like one of those perspe perspectival elephants in the room. Uh, and then the, the theme of chapter four is all about poetry. It's about how the Old Testament books, particularly um, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah use poetry and poetic language um, to depict the plight of uh, the people of Israel in exile, um, in Babylon, and their, you know, seemingly broken relationship with God, but, and then um, their despair, their, their uh, mourning, and then their hope, and all of these different emotions, and how they imagine God to be. And in this, he brings out that these various prophets um, imagined different responses from God, um, imagined different, different possibilities of what would happen regarding their relationship with God, um, and imagined different responses from themselves, from their people, um, as to what they should do to repair the relationship with God, and also poetic images of what the new restored future would be when this relationship was repaired. So over the course of time, um, they go from despair and, and a sense of almost hopelessness to um, great hope as they imagine what this reparation would look like and what the future of a, you know, a, a people that was reunited with God and was, was, was okay um, in God's sight, what that would look like. So the reason why Brueggemann dwells on poetry, it seems, is that he wants to show, and he says this towards the end of the chapter, that there can be many responses and many imaginations regarding um, God and human relationship to God. And that there's nothing in the Old Testament that says that there's only one orthodox way and that all other ways are forbidden or to be stamped out. In other words, there's a lot, there's a multiplicity and a diversity of responses expressed through this very creative, imaginative, poetic language. Um, and again, he looks at that 
um, and doesn't ignore the, that fact, the fact that that's, that's there, that there's just not just one orthodox response and one orthodox message or one orthodox imagination of what the future would be. It would be united by a belief and faith in God and a desire to please God, but exactly what that would look like and, and how to do it um, varied. And, uh, and Brueggemann wants to embrace that. I think this is, well, you know, it has to be because, as he says towards the end of the chapter, um, religious people have a good way of basically um, negating themselves through infighting. Um, they argue endlessly, sometimes within, you know, even within sects of whatever the religion is, but in this case we're mainly talking Christianity, um, they argue with themselves about the smallest things, and churches break up and splinter and splinter and splinter and splinter. And all this does is it stops them, the, the people within them, from being able to like get on with things, repair the relationship with God, have a good one, and then actually do something in the world with that relationship. So it's very convenient um, for the cause of doing nothing to continue to like fight over um, expressions, all of which might be considered devout. It's it's maybe just um, it's just uh, not not conducive to actually like practicing the faith. So I think this is why he dwells on the power of poetry and its place, especially in the Old Testament. Speaking of Ezekiel, Jeremiah. And Isaiah, he says, if we take these three great poetic traditions, we are able to see in broad outline that they virtual variously advocate a future for Yahweh's people that will be priestly, scribal, or royal, right? So like priestly, obvious meaning, scribal, scholarly, intellectual, I suppose, or royal, political, you know, using, using government power. Um, all are imagined and none are chosen as the one way and the others stamped out. He says, the rhetoric of restoration abounds in this poetry. Restoration. I love the image of the butterfly coming out of the chrysalis. This is a rebirth type of language um, that Brueggemann's describing here. He says in 36, 24 through 29, that's from Ezekiel, the poet can tersely embrace motifs of homecoming, cultic cleansing to qualify to be in Yahweh's presence, a new will for obedience, uh, and a revivification of the fruitfulness of creation. The poetry is clearly designed to shake the displaced out of lethargy, despair, and excessive accommodations to the force of empire. And this is the other thing that poetic language can do that just like straight up, you know, reasoning or philosophical texts can't do. They generally can't like basically inspire at the emotional level and gain people's love and loyalty in the same way that poetic expressions can. Um, because poetic expressions provide imagery imagery. They help the imagination, and that's what people need to actually embrace a new life to get off of one way and move on to another. So the book is entitled Out of Babylon, and it's becoming more clear why Brueggemann chose that title, because he literally is he's not saying simply that, you know, at a certain point the uh, people of Israel escape or like come out of Babylon, Although that is a part of it, like what does it take for people to leave empire behind, at least mentally and in their action, to get beyond obedience to the powers that be within their society and do something different. But also, here in this chapter, he wants to say that new hope and new promises come out of Babylon, that it takes the Babylon experience of basically being oppressed being within this all-encompassing cage of power that seems relentless and just um, completely um, insurmountable, it takes that kind of opposition to bring out the very strength that people can find within themselves. And in this case, in relationship to God, it draws that new hope 
out of Babylon in a way that couldn't be couldn't be had um, in a in a softer experience, you might say. So poetic prophecy like this imagines life beyond Babylon because people are in Babylon, and it's the ultimate act of hope to live within it and yet imagine beyond it. And I might add to risk being called unrealistic, to risk being called some sort of dreamer. We have to realize that the greatest changes that have ever happened in human history have happened because somebody dreamed them up and somebody dared to follow them and somebody dared to try. And then a whole lot of people in a lot of cases get on board. And so, um, literally poetic prophecy, imagining a life beyond Babylon, creates that life to a certain extent. And this is what Brueggemann is saying, is that the first act of creating that new life is imagining it, okay? To be able to break free mentally, right? Um, and then to hopefully, uh, you know, bring others to that uh, emancipation as well. Poetic imagination provides various ways out, so not just one way, and this is another place where people fall down, right? Um, imagining one orthodox way, and we've already talked about that. He says, all the coercive force of empire is said to become the seedbed and venue for new poetry that was heard among Jews as a voice and therefore as the presence of God, the God who has refused to abandon the displaced. So it's a little murky. Where does the human imagination leave off and God's imagination for human beings commence? Um, human beings in this book are depicted as creative instigators who work with the Spirit of God to create change. So there isn't a clear line of demarcation. And um, the end of that sentence is very important. God has refused to abandon the displaced in his love for those who have been displaced, in this case, to be exiled and to be captured by Babylon. Um, he continues to basically commune with people. And I dare say that one of the ways that this happens is through the fostering of this poetic imagination this sort of rekindling of the love that people have for something beyond their imperial domination. Uh, so, so this time I'll end on this quote, which kind of brings this back to our current situation a bit. He says, as long as the displaced people are drugged by the ideological claims of Babylon, there will be no energy for departure and restoration. Thus, this poetry of possibility serves to generate energy and courage to imagine and enact a future that the empire has sought to void. I would suggest by this picture that this is the current mode of imagination in many U.S. churches. What are we going to build next? And I'm not saying that we might not occasionally need another church built, although there are certainly a lot of them already around but rather that this is often the limits of the imagination of the leadership. Instead of asking what can we do beyond what we're already doing with what we have. So that is not the prophetic imagination that people need. And I think Walter Brueggemann provides a glimpse at to, as to what that imagination might look like if it were voiced by different parties. So, on to chapter five next time. I hope you're enjoying Out of Babylon. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel. I also have a podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. It's the same thing, just without the pictures.